In the fall of 1964, the Programma 101 received its christening. Despite the tribulations, something new and unique has finally left the Olivetto's lab, but again, its uniqueness was part of a new problem. It was time to figure out how to introduce that unique piece to the market, that is, how to set up mass production. In front of you there is the prototype of the Programma 101. It's sleek, modern Edman would use the word sexy. Anyway, there's something more important. It works fine. It seems to be a reliable machine. But it is one, just one. And your company has recently dismantled every production line destined to assemble electronic machines. Any expert in the field has left and a top manager claims that the company risked bankruptcy due to the electronics division. And you have to convince the entire company board that your brand new computer is gonna be the next hot thing in the business. That's gonna be a rough sale. Olivetti's management wasn't excited by this peculiar machine halfway between a calculator and a computer. For starters, they didn't like the aesthetic. The prototype was functional but cumbersome, so they proposed a design that, besides being quite nice, completely betrayed the idea behind the Programma 101. According to the draft they proposed, the machine had to be sturdy and heavy to the point of being unmovable. Moreover, the ergonomic structure of the prototype was replaced with a fascinating yet uncomfortable design. The Perotto team sternly opposed this draft and called him Mario Bellini. This young, promising architect understood the concept behind the prototype and managed to draw the machine chassis without sacrificing beauty for user experience. That's why the Programma 101 had been exhibited at the MoMA and won Bellini a golden compass the most revered industrial design award in Italy. Nevertheless, this wasn't enough to conquer the heart of Olivetti's managers. Accountants said the whole programmer's venture was dangerous because the profit margin was going to be too narrow. Customer care and plant managers were also concerned, for everyone who had training in electronics had already left the company, and therefore no one was able to take care of defective units anymore. What about sales? Well, they claimed the programma was a hybrid machine, something nobody would have bought, because there was no market for such a product yet. So yes, it may seem absurd, but in a few words they opposed the programma 101 because it was too innovative. But you know, innovative sounds good. This machine still could be of some use to the company. It says that we are still running towards the future. That's what managers thought when they decided to put the programma on display at the Business Equipment Manufacturers Association Expo, that is, the BIMA. Her tutors didn't really want her to shine, but with the help of a few trustworthy friends, she made it to the Prince's Ball. And despite everyone's expectations, she became the queen of the dance. This plot summarizes both Cinderella's tale and how the program fared at the New York BIMA in 1965. When the fair opened, the program was exhibited in a back room of the Olivetti stand, someplace secluded and off site. The company wanted to showcase the calculators, the flagship products, which therefore occupied the front row. However, a fair is meant to be visited in its entirety, so visitors rapidly discovered where the programma was hidden. 
people started to flood the small room, thus forcing Olivetti to organize a security service focused on managing the crowd. How much is it? Can we already have one? People couldn't wait to bring a computer home. Someone was more skeptic, according to De Sandre. The American, American. You know, when we showcased the program, we found people inspecting the pedestal the machine sat on, looking for wires. They suspected the computer was connected to a bigger mainframe. The fair was an immense success in terms of PR. Visitors placed several orders, while newspapers started spreading the word. The New York Times, Business Week, the New York Herald Tribune, you name it. Everyone was talking about the Programma 101, the machine filling the gap between large conventional computers and desk calculators. But what's the feeling you get from using the first personal computer? What could you possibly do with a Programma 101? If we look at the computers sitting on our desks today, we see a bunch of stuff. First a keyboard, with 100 keys and more. Then a display, a trackpad, USB port, CD tray, webcam and microphone. Take a look at the photos we published on our site, italianculturepodcast.com. You'll see a keyboard with just 37 numerical keys, a green control light that tells whether the machine is on, a proper reel and a magnetic card slot. That's it. A primitive interface indeed. Today you can check the input in real time just by looking at the display, whereas when you used the program, you either gave the correct input or found the error later on, printed on the paper strip the machine spread out. Do you need to store a few files? Nothing easier. Modern computer hard disks are one terabyte large, that is 1000 billions of bytes. Programmer's magnetic card could save up to 408 bytes. If you're looking for an adventure, you can transfer the content of the aforementioned one terabyte hard disk to the programmer's magnetic card. You'll just need two billions of them. Sometimes, though, you go for mobility rather than power. While modern laptops weigh around half a kilogram, the programma fitted a suitcase that, all considered, weighed 30 kilos. So it wasn't exactly a feather, but it could be moved around. The machine was indeed an immense step forward in terms of mobility, because older computers weighed several tons and couldn't be moved at all. Another important area the programma improved on is pricing. The cheaper IBM computer was sold for $100,000 in 1968, which converts in over $700,000 today. In comparison to that, the prototype managed to design a rather inexpensive machine, priced over 2 million of lire in 68, which now would amount to $23,000. You probably wouldn't have bought it during a shopping spree at the mall. Yet, it's something a small firm or a wealthy family could have purchased. Now, you just unpacked your brand new Programma 101. It sits all shiny on your desk. What can you do with this machine? Again, not much in comparison to modern standards. You cannot write a paper on the Programma 101. You cannot watch a film or draw. Obviously, there is no internet connection. There are only a few programs, mostly calculation related. But there is a game you can play, some kind of craps the machine really like to win. By the way, we'll talk more about that in the forthcoming extra episode to be released the next Monday. So nowadays, in order to launch a program or an app, you either tap on the screen or, if you're using a computer, double click on the icon. The programmer's programs instead were stored in small magnetic cards used lead in the machine and waited for them to be loaded. Then you could input the data. Then the machine gave you an output. This was a convenient solution for the time, since it allowed everyone to use a computer without requiring a prior knowledge in programming. The program came with an array of pre-designed programs, but it also allowed users to write their own, save them on a magnetic card and load them anytime they needed. 
And that's a revolutionary. All the people who had a knack for computer science were able to fully customize the use of the machine by crafting the programs they needed. This led the Programmer 101 to be the most versatile computer around back then. For instance, we know of several applications that went way beyond the Deperotto team's expectations. Gardiera. You could find any program you needed. Before the program hit the American market, the company sent me to the US, where a team of 20 developers was writing software that was meant to be sold with the machine at launch. Afterward, Olivetti published the several tomes full of instructions you followed to save new software on spare cards. I have one of those books here, and it contains nine chapters, each one presenting a few specialized programs. There's software for electronic engineering, mechanical engineering, chemistry, economics, statistics, and more. Nine different disciplines, each one has its own set of programs.